I remember, you know, being in a, in a gender studies class. I'm sorry. When, <laughs> when I was a, a sophomore, a friend of mine convinced me to do it. Um, and I'm glad I did in retrospect, but it was, it was quite bad. Um, and we read, we read Foucault, uh, I, th- I think history of sexuality. Mm. And this was one of those classrooms where, you know, it, it was actually the strangest classroom I was ever in at Columbia because it, no one would almost ever ask the, the professor questions. Right. There would maybe be one or two questions per class. And, and we were dealing with some heavy ideas, regardless of whether you agreed or not. Right. Like the, where, whereas in all my other philosophy classes, there would always be, you know, pesky students like myself trying to bring up objections and a, like lively discussion. But this one, it was, it was dead. It was a dead classroom. And we read Foucault and you know, I, I remember bringing up the point because I think I had recently read Thomas Nagel's uh, book. You're from nowhere. The, the, last, wo- the last word, actually. Hmm. Um, where he, you know, one of the points he makes is that, you know, po- postmodern skepticism of objective truth inevitably bites its own tail because if nothing is objectively true, then how do you know, how do you know postmodernism itself is objectively true? And I brought up this point. Uh, for, first, I want to know, is that a good critique of postmodernism, do you think? And you know, I just r- remember that the professor giving some very hand-waving answer. Oh, Foucault sorts that stuff out. Huh. Well, it just depends. Kinda... Is it good? It depends on who you ask. Right. Uh, and not in a cheeky way, because if you ask a postmodernist, they would say that it misses the point entirely. Mm. Um, no. And the postmodernism deals with this simply by by acknowledging that it doesn't believe that it's objectively true. It believes that nothing's objectively true, and so that right. it must be self skeptical, radically self skeptical, also. And that's where you see it, you know, kind of devolving into Derrida's play, and and, exactly. and so on like that. Which, of course, later generations discovered wasn't that useful for activism. Um, you can't really do anything with with something mm. that. Right. I mean, even Judith Butler wrote that it, it would be she didn't <coughs> consider herself a postmodernist because it would be inappropriate even to, to 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 take that label or even to give that label meaning. It would be anti postmodern to define postmodernism. And so, so uh, but if you ask somebody from outside of it, um, yeah, it's a pretty pretty good criticism of it. <laughs> so let me let me jump in there and and that was Habermas's Jürgen Habermas's the German philosopher's critique of Derrida. And that it's a performative contradiction. You're using rationality to undermine the tools of rationality. That idea has a an ancient pedigree in the literature. You, you see that in in the Platonic dialogue. You see that in well, literally throughout the history of Western intellectual thought. But it's an old old idea. But it doesn't seem to bother to people if you don't subscribe to the rules of reason and logic, then the criticism that you don't subscribe to the rules of reason and logic only works if you subscribe to the rules of reason and logic. So right. I think Jim's absolutely correct. They just they just hand wave it off. And so that actually, by the way, highlights the tension in case any of your listeners don't realize Habermas is the last really of the critical theorists. He was the last member really of the Frankfurt School in any significant way. And of course, this is post Marcusa, post the riots of right. the, the 1960s, post Marcusa going on television in the 1970s and yelling about how anti-intellectual his movement had become. Uh, and so he had a much, you know, more tempered and reasonable view of um, the critical approach. But more importantly, as you see, he had this rather vigorous or vicious critique of Derrida, which indicates that there yeah. was, in fact, tension between the critical theory approach, which was ultimately modernist, and the postmodernist approach, as you as you pointed out. So I want to, if it's okay, Coleman, I, I want to linger on that for a minute. I think it's important for listeners to understand one of the objectives, and I just finished Kendry's book, and I, I'm, I see this scattered throughout the literature, is to remove the tools by which one makes discerning judgments about things. This comes up a little bit in cynical theories, but when you remove the tools, scientific rationality, epistemic adequacy, consistency, 
then it becomes impossible to make to kind of step outside of a system and adjudicate competing claims. It, it becomes impossible to do that. And this is really the overarching goal is to remove the ability to make judgments, particularly epistemological and moral moral judgments. And it's utterly terrifying consequences of, of that. 